I want to introduce this film from the standpoint of a soldier who was taught to use nuclear weapons and as a diplomat who worked hard for their elimination. As a 21-year-old second lieutenant assigned to Germany, one of my first missions was to guard an atomic cannon, a huge machine that ran around Germany on a couple of trucks. And its mission was to shoot nuclear weapons at the Russian armed forces if they ever came across the border in the vicinity of the Fulda Gap. A few years later, as a captain, I was taught how to actually employ this weapon and other similar weapons. I was taught how to determine what the blast effects of such weapons would be, how many people would be killed by the blast, how many buildings would be knocked down. I was also taught what the thermal effects would be, how things would be burned, how people would be burned. I was taught about the radiation effects, and I was taught to plot the fallout pattern that would come from the use of nuclear weapons as the dirt was thrown up into the sky and spread out across the landscape. Many years later, as a corps commander back in Germany, commanding 75,000 troops, my mission was to stop the waves of Russian forces that would be coming through the Fulda Gap. And in those days, we thought we could only stop the first or second wave before we would have to call for nuclear weapons to stop the rest of the Russian armies coming through. And I would work with my staff to look at the effects of using nuclear weapons in West Germany on our side of the border against Russian armies that had come through. And we thought about what the Russians would do in return, and we wondered whether or not it could be stopped at that level or whether it would escalate all the way up to strategic thermonuclear exchange with all that would mean for the existence of the world, all the millions of people who would be killed by such an exchange. It was an existential issue, and the more I got into nuclear weapons, the more I realized these weapons must never be used. And then I became chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in 1989, and I had 28,000 nuclear weapons under my supervision. And every morning, I looked to see where the Russian submarines were off the coast of Virginia and how far away those missiles were from Washington. And I kept track of where the Russian missiles were in Europe and in the Soviet Union. And the one thing I convinced myself of after all these years of exposure to the use of nuclear weapons is that they were useless. They could not be used. So you can have deterrence with an even lower number of weapons. Well, then why stop there? Why not continue on? Why not get rid of them altogether? The real threat now is not from states that understand that you cannot use these weapons without inviting suicidal response, but terrorists who do not care about suicidal response, terrorists who are prepared to commit suicide themselves. And so it is important at this point in our international history that we all come together behind this initiative that you're going to hear about to make sure that we start a process that will lead to the reduction in the number of nuclear weapons that exist in the arsenals of the world now that will deter other nations from moving forward on nuclear weapons programs, but above all, will capture and contain the elements that are out there, the devices that are out there, the technology that is out there, the uranium and plutonium sources that may be out there that a terrorist could get his hands on to try to develop a rudimentary or a real nuclear weapon. This is a noble cause, and what you're about to hear are four men who have worked in this field for most of their adult lives, who have given their lives to protecting our nation, but at the same time believe that this is the moment when we have to move forward and all of us come together to reduce the number of nuclear weapons and then eliminate them from the face of the earth. The film features four of the most distinguished Americans I have ever had the privilege of serving with, four men who I can call my dear friends. Former Secretaries of State Henry Kissinger and George Shultz, former Secretary of Defense Bill Perry, and former Senator Sam Nunn. I think you will find this film interesting, and I hope it will motivate you to support this effort. Thank you.
is not a theoretical question. The 9-11 Commission reports Al-Qaeda has been trying to acquire or make a nuclear weapon for a decade. Could they do that? Highly enriched uranium and plutonium, the raw material to make a bomb, is scattered over about 40 countries, sometimes under very lax security. According to the 9-11 Commission, once terrorists get these materials, a trained nuclear engineer could fashion a bomb using commercially available materials and machine tools. The terrorists who want that material don't need much of it, and there are lots of places where they could steal it. Four men who helped navigate the Cold War, four cold warriors, know all too well the dangers we face. Former Secretary of State George Shultz knows firsthand the devastation nuclear weapons can cause from his World War II service in the Pacific. Former National Security Advisor and Secretary of State Henry Kissinger lived daily with the threat of a nuclear exchange while in the White House. Former Secretary of Defense William Perry knows all too well how close the world has come to nuclear annihilation. And former Senator Sam Nunn has devoted much of his career to preserving this nation's security while reducing the danger of a nuclear exchange. Working with the Nuclear Threat Initiative, co-chaired by Ted Turner and Sam Nunn, and the Hoover Institution, the four have formed the Nuclear Security Project a nonpartisan effort to link the vision of a world free of nuclear weapons with urgent steps to be taken to reduce nuclear risks. They first proposed their vision and the essential steps in a Wall Street Journal article that sent shockwaves through the global foreign policy establishment. Their message was a simple one. If we want other nations of the world to join us in a tough approach to preventing nuclear terrorism and the continued spread of nuclear weapons, we must be willing to recommit to the vision of a world without nuclear weapons and to lead the world in taking concrete actions to reduce nuclear dangers. The actions, a series of urgent and achievable steps, are an agenda for change, for a more secure and safer world. The four recognize this bold agenda cannot be accomplished by the United States alone. These goals must become a joint enterprise among nations to make urgently needed progress to reduce the risks now posed by nuclear weapons and materials. But progress must be made, a simple truth they know from personal experience. George Shultz was a young Marine on a ship headed for the invasion of Japan when he first heard of nuclear weapons. And we had hardly left our harbor when news came to the ship that something called an atomic bomb had been dropped. And we asked around, nobody had a clue about what it was. Our ship lumbered along, and then we heard another atomic bomb had been dropped. By the time we got to port, the war was over. Uh, we couldn't help but make the association that these two atomic bombs may have saved our lives. My thinking about these weapons evolved. At first, what you're trying to do is understand what is this anyway. And then you see pictures of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And you begin to see the horror and the inhumanity of them. For me, the most searing question was what I would actually tell the president if he turned to me and said, I've done everything I can in the diplomatic field, and my only option now is to use nuclear weapons. Of all the decisions that were before me, 
that was the most haunting one. Back during the Cold War, we basically had a period, as, as I view it, of very high risk, but we had uh, stability in one strange paradoxical sense, and that is both sides knew that if there was a war, or if a conventional war became a nuclear war, that the survival of their own nation was at stake. We, collectively, were diligent in terms of maintaining the weapons, in terms of maintaining security. We were uh, very conscious and sensitive to the great dangers of those weapons, in most cases, uh, and we were very good at what we were doing in terms of the professional men and women in the military, indeed on both sides. But we were also very lucky. There were a number of times that I know about, and probably a lot more that I don't know about, where only uh, by the grace of God did we avoid uh, going to war. It was about 1978 when I was uh, awoken by a phone call at 3 o'clock in the morning from the general who was the watch officer at the North American Air Defense Command. And he told me that his computers were showing 200 missiles on the way from the Soviet Union to the United States. Now, that, of course, was a false alarm. The point of that story is that the danger of a nuclear war, the danger of a nuclear holocaust, was not academic to me. That experience in particular brought it very close to, to my consciousness. People talk about the concept of deterrence. It worked in an uneasy way during the Cold War when you had two countries, mainly. But the more countries you have, the more difficult that concept is. And if the existing nuclear countries cannot develop some restraints among themselves, in other words, if nothing fundamental changes, then I would expect that a use of nuclear weapons in some 10-year period is very possible. The world has changed since the end of the Cold War. More countries have nuclear weapons and others are attempting to develop nuclear weapons capabilities. The world needs energy, and that has many countries understandably turning to nuclear power, which unless safely and securely managed, could also spread sensitive technologies to make the materials essential to a nuclear bomb. The simple fact is, we need new strategies to deal with today's nuclear threats. If you can learn how to enrich fuel for a nuclear power plant, you've learned how to enrich it for a weapon. And we have seen already in a country like Pakistan, which is a reasonably well-developed country, that a whole system of proliferation was either possible or tolerated that spread nuclear technology to uh, Libya, uh, North Korea, and some other rogue states. As nations like Iran and Pakistan, North Korea get nuclear bombs, then the probability increases that one or more of those bombs will fall into the hands of a terror group. The classical notion of deterrence was that there were some consequences before which aggressors and evildoers would recoil. In a world of suicide bombers, uh, that calculation doesn't operate in any comparable way. And if you think of the people who are doing suicide attacks, and people like that get a nuclear weapon, they are almost by definition not deterrable. And if you have terrorists get something, then you don't even know the return address. So I think it's a very dangerous moment. The danger is not simply more nations with nuclear weapons, but that material to make a bomb is scattered around the world. A lot of potential sources for terrorists. No terror group that we are aware of, even if they were well-financed and well-organized, can build a nuclear weapon from scratch. But if they got the fissile material through another nation, either by buying or stealing it, if they got the right kind of fissile material, then it's not 
simple to build a nuclear weapon, but it is feasible. Plans for such a device were found on computers that were part of the AQ Khan smuggling ring. A gang that we know sold nuclear weapons information and equipment to Libya, Iran, North Korea, and possibly other nations or terrorist groups. We don't know who might have those plans. We do know that nuclear technology, closely guarded during the Cold War, has gradually seeped into the global information database. The International Atomic Energy Agency says there have been more than 1,300 nuclear smuggling incidents since 1993, nearly 20 of which have involved the transfer of weapons usable material. The director of the agency has sounded the alarm, warning that the possibility of terrorists obtaining nuclear or other radioactive material remains a grave threat, and that sometimes material is found that had not been reported missing. We know several things. We know that the know-how in terms of how to make a crude weapon has exploded over the last 10, 15 years. So the availability of information about the science required to make a weapon is out there now. Not a piece of cake, but doable. The second thing we know is the nuclear material, highly enriched uranium, plutonium is spread all over the world. And without the material, you can't make a weapon. And the third thing we know is the terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda, but not limited to Al-Qaeda, are seeking this nuclear material and would like to make a weapon. They've said so, and I believe them. There are still a lot of bombs or the material to make them that terrorists could steal or perhaps buy on the black market. They don't need much. The amount of highly enriched uranium used in the Hiroshima bomb could have fit in a one gallon milk jug. Here's what that did. And of course, I always had in the back of my mind these pictures of Nagasaki and Hiroshima and the devastation. I have been writing about nuclear weapons for over 50 years now. I try to apply traditional diplomatic principles to a world with nuclear weapons. And uh, I found it almost, imp I would say, impossible to do. So the consequences uh, have to look, be looked at at two levels. One is technically what happens if, say, a 20 kiloton weapon hits downtown uh, New York. And that's a very small weapon. Uh, we're talking probably about 100,000 casualties, economic losses in hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars. But beyond that, the political and the social catastrophe is something that we cannot even really imagine today. Most of the hospitals, most of the medical facilities, most of the bars, most of the bridges, uh, most of the communications would be gone. We all believe that a terrorist group would claim responsibility and then go on to assert that they had planted bombs in perhaps five other cities of the United States and were threatening to set them off unless certain demands were met. And it's almost impossible to contemplate the hysteria and the terror that would set in. You can imagine the people fleeing from the cities. The social and economic structure of the United States collapsing under that. There's a second level, namely, what do people think happened that permitted such casualties to occur? And what will they demand of their government? And if they, they will probably say globally, if this can't be prevented, what's the use of any government? Well, first I should say 
that the call to eliminate nuclear weapons is not new. It has been stated many times by many people. Today, every inhabitant of this planet must contemplate the day when this planet may no longer be habitable. Every man, woman, and child lives under a nuclear sword of Damocles, hanging by the slenderest of threads, capable of being cut at any moment by accident or miscalculation or by madness. The weapons of war must be abolished before they abolish us. There is only one way safely and legitimately to reduce the cost of national security, and that is to reduce the need for it. And this we're trying to do in negotiations with the Soviet Union. We're not just discussing limits on a further increase of nuclear weapons. We seek instead to reduce their number. We seek the total elimination one day of nuclear weapons from the face of the earth. President Reagan and Soviet President Gorbachev came close to agreement on that vision in 1986 when the two met in Reykjavik, Iceland. But disagreements over missile defense proved a stumbling block. Out of it all came this notion that we, we would try to eliminate ballistic missiles, eliminate nuclear weapons, but all contingent on confining strategic defense to the laboratory. And I remember Gorbachev said to the president, Mr. President, if we agree to eliminate ballistic missiles, why do you need a defense against them? And President Reagan said, we'll share our technology with you. And Gorbachev said, Mr. President, you won't even sell milk technology to us. And things sort of ended on that sort of a note. But the idea of eliminating ballistic missiles and the idea of eliminating nuclear weapons had been discussed seriously. And both the leader of the Soviet Union and the leader of the United States had said they agreed with that idea. I believe that Reykjavik was the real pinnacle of international politics, that is to say, from the high ground we saw the prospects of a future world, and we both believed that a world of the future could prosper only if it's a world without nuclear weapons. We know from historical record that both presidents were serious about eliminating weapons, but that was a controversial idea ahead of its time. I went to Brussels to brief our allies and then back to Washington. And one of the first things that happened was Margaret Thatcher came to Washington and she invited me over to the British ambassador's residence and she took me to the woodshed. And going along with the president on the idea of getting rid of nuclear weapons, are you out of your mind? And then she went up to Camp David and she I'm sure she sort of gotten it out of her system a little bit with me. I'm an easier target. But she gave President Reagan a dose of the same. President Reagan and General Secretary Gorbachev put this subject on the table. But the world, it was shocking to the world. The Reykjavik summit did lead to landmark nuclear arms reduction treaties. But President Reagan and President Gorbachev's vision was not realized. Two decades later, at a conference at the conservative Hoover Institution, the idea of a new and different initiative was born, one that could deal with the new challenges facing our world. In our meetings at Stanford a few years ago, on the anniversary of the Reykjavik summit, we came to believe then that the idea of eliminating nuclear weapons had finally come. We were convinced, all of us, that we could not keep asking other societies to restrain their participation in the nuclear field if we were not prepared to accept limits to our activities. 
So we began to look at steps that we could take to show America's commitment. What is perhaps new about this initiative is that the four people whose names were attached to that are all what you might call Cold Warriors, the people who had prominent positions during the Cold War in building up the nuclear weapons of, of the United States. All of us had been identified throughout our lives with being committed to national defense. And we remain committed to national defense. We've set out to create something that's not partisan at all, that is a subject of central importance for the United States and for mankind generally. You're talking about a process, and that process will build, if it succeeds, on itself. But even if it were to stop at some point, it would make a contribution. The process involves a series of steps leading toward the goal of a world free of nuclear weapons. The steps include securing all nuclear weapons to the highest standards, discarding Cold War practices to decrease the danger of accidental or unauthorized launch, reducing substantially nuclear forces, eliminating short-range battlefield nuclear weapons, halting the production of plutonium and highly enriched uranium for nuclear weapons globally. They would also include adopting a process for bringing the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty into effect, strengthening verification and enforcement capabilities, and redoubling efforts to resolve regional conflicts. Because the path will be long and difficult, the United States must have nuclear weapons as long as any other nation or group possesses them. But the process must start now, and others must join the effort. If the United States leads and recommits itself to this vision, it is more likely other nations will join in taking the urgent actions we need to prevent nuclear terrorism and the further spread of nuclear weapons and materials around the globe. Each step is doable. Each reduces nuclear threats. Each takes us closer to the gold by building confidence and trust. Each is one that nations must take cooperatively, not unilaterally. Each helps build to a world that our children and grandchildren can live in, free of the fear of nuclear annihilation. Well, there are a few steps that are relatively easy to take that have a pretty big payoff. Uh, one of them, for example, would be simply reducing the alert status of the nuclear weapons in the present nuclear powers. We still have thousands of weapons that are on quick launch that uh, can be launched very rapidly, and we still have a fear, particularly on the Russian side, that they could be overwhelmed with a first strike. I described uh, earlier when an American general in charge of our launching our missiles thought that we were under attack. He made the right decision that it was a false alarm, but he had only 15 minutes to make that decision. The probability of his making the right decision would be dramatically increased if he had had 15 hours instead of 15 minutes. Now, most people would assume that cannot be the Cold War is over. Are we still in this posture? The answer is we are. The number of weapons on quick launch on both sides is uh, something to me that is absolutely ridiculous, bordering on insanity. If we're not gonna use them at the very beginning of any kind of confrontation, and we don't fear the other side can use them at the very beginning, then we're gonna have less of a hair trigger. And if we have, let's say, four or five minutes warning now, we ought to double it. And once we get to 10 minutes, we ought to go to 20, and then to 40, and then to 60, and then to hours and then days, and nuclear weapons become less relevant. It's awfully hard to cooperate uh, in a true sense of the word and to be tr partners in a true sense of the word. It's hard to do that when you're still pointing thousands of weapons at each other with very little warning time and when both sides fear a first strike from the other. Uh, those things simply don't go together. So we've got to change the psychology. Uh, we've got to back off 
uh, some of the concepts we had during the Cold War, and we've got to understand that the threat has changed. That America's security could depend on Russia's early warning or command and control systems working perfectly 365 days a year is an absurd situation in today's security environment. Mistakes can and do happen, including in the United States military, where there is evidence that attention to nuclear weapons security has diminished. In August 2007, an Air Force B-52 was mistakenly loaded with six nuclear missiles and flown from North Dakota to Louisiana across America's heartland. No one knew where the weapons were for 36 hours. In fact, no one even knew they were missing. We've also learned that nuclear bomb fuse assemblies were mistakenly shipped to Taiwan instead of helicopter batteries. Security lapses so serious that the Secretary of Defense fired both the civilian head of the Air Force and the general serving as chief of staff. The fact that we could put nuclear armed missiles on an airplane and fly them for hours without anybody realizing what was happening, I think is a reflection of two factors. First of all, that we still have lots of nuclear weapons in our inventory. But secondly, our military today rightly doesn't believe the nuclear weapons are key to maintaining the security. And therefore, they don't have the same level of attention, high level attention, high level uh, oversight that they had at one time. In a way, this is the most dangerous of all worlds, where you still have all these nuclear weapons, but you're not paying enough attention to them. At least during the Cold War, when we had these huge nuclear arsenals, they were given very serious attention. I cannot imagine an incident like that, for example, having happened during the Cold War. Everybody who has technology knows that technology can go wrong. We should take that kind of scenario out of the equation. We should do everything we can to reduce the chances of an accident. And that is particularly true in an age of terror. And it is particularly true in an age where you have cyber capabilities and it is possible to simulate a nuclear attack that might be picked up by warning systems. There are a number of other steps that we need to take to reduce nuclear dangers in the near term. Nuclear weapons that are so-called tactical weapons, they're smaller, they're more mobile. They're also just the kind of a weapon that would be a handy thing for a terrorist to get a hold of. So one of the steps that we propose is Let's get hold of all these weapons, and let's get rid of them right now. Another step that can be taken is to eliminate sources of highly enriched uranium, for example, that could be bought or stolen by a terror group. There are research reactors located around the world um, that use highly enriched uranium, and that's not necessary. And as energy prices continue to rise, harnessing the power of the atom is seen as a clean source of electricity. In order to prevent the carbon from being spewed into the atmosphere, which could precipitate the global warming, um, more and more nations are turning to nuclear reactors, which is a perfectly reasonable action for them to take. But the danger of that is that in generating the fuel for the nuclear reactors, the country has gone through a process which could, if continued for another few cycles, would lead to the same kind of uranium that could be used for a nuclear bomb. The solution to the problem is known. It is to allow countries to have nuclear reactors, which deals with the environmental problem, but under the conditions in which they do not have control of the fuel cycle. They do not process the fuel. Nuclear power does furnish a lot of hope for mankind, but only if it's safe and only if it's secure. We're also working hard to try to set up the concept of a fuel bank. Uh, based on Warren Buffett's generosity, I was able to go over to uh, Vienna and pledge $50 million to the International Atomic Energy Agency. If they raised $100 million additional to set up a last resort uh, fuel supply so that we can say to countries around the globe, you don't have to have your own enrichment. 
Over the long term, we need to be heading towards the total elimination of nuclear weapons. And over the short term, we need to be taking the steps to reduce the danger that the nuclear weapons we already have could be used. This is such an important problem in my mind that it dwarfs all other considerations. And I have myself decided to devote the balance of my career to working to achieve that goal. I believe that we need a vision. We need a vision of a world without nuclear weapons. It's gonna take a long time to get there. There are all sorts of steps that we have to take to be able to even move toward that vision where we make nuclear weapons less relevant, where we prevent their proliferation, and where we eventually end them as a threat to the world. That vision is essential to build the cooperation we need from countries around the globe in terms of taking the steps we need to prevent a nuclear nightmare. So the vision and the steps, in my view, go together. We have always insisted on saying, let us test each proposition and see how it actually works and see whether it can be made to work. And we have not come to a point yet where one would say it's unworkable. And that I consider great progress. These ideas are not abstract concepts. They have been proven to work in the real world. In the early 1990s, Ukraine, Belarus, and Kazakhstan agreed to remove all nuclear weapons from their territories. This joint effort was made possible through a cooperative program started by Republican Senator Richard Lugar and Democratic Senator Sam Nunn. Since the end of the Cold War, the United States, Russia, and the former Soviet Union working together have deactivated or destroyed over 7,000 nuclear warheads, as well as hundreds of missiles, launchers, bombers, submarines, test tunnels, and other tools of nuclear war. Before I became secretary, I had worked with Senator Nunn and Senator Lugar to craft the Nunn-Lugar program because I believed, as they believed, that the so-called loose nukes problem was the gravest security danger we faced. A few years later, I became the Secretary of Defense. I helped then negotiate with Russia and Ukraine what was called the Trilateral Agreement, by which Ukraine agreed to give up its thousands of nuclear weapons that it had inherited when the Cold War was over. And so with the Ukrainian Minister of Defense, I visited their primary site where the dismantlement was going on four different times. The first time we oversaw the removal of the warhead from the missile. Uh, the second time we oversaw the removal of the missiles from the silos. The third time, I went along with the Ukrainian and the Russian defense minister, and we blew up a silo. The following spring, Secretary Perry and the commanders of those missile silos planted sunflowers on the site, turning sources of death and destruction to fields of peace, hope, and livelihood for the citizens of Ukraine. And much of what was accomplished in those years continues to pay dividends today. Well, let me give you one example. We, we uh, were able to make a deal uh, in the 1990s to say to them, OK, you've got a value in your highly enriched uranium that's in the weapons that's that are aimed at the United States. We will work with you to take that highly enriched uranium and let Russia process it. Take your weapon apart, let Russia process the highly enriched uranium into low enriched uranium, which can be burned in power plants, and we will buy it. If you look at electricity in this country, 19% of it uh, comes from nuclear power. We are buying about half of the uh, material we use in our nuclear power plants from uh, the highly enriched uranium that has been blended down from those weapons. So mathematically, if you look at uh, light bulbs in this country or any other form of electricity, one out of 10 light bulbs is coming from weapons that were aimed at us. When nuclear material from dismantled warheads is used to light the homes of former enemies, swords are turned into plowshares. It shows what's possible and gives us hope that the vision of
of the four cold warriors is achievable. When we wrote the first article, I thought it would be a statement that might attract the attention and occasional op-ed piece receives, but it generated an extraordinary amount of correspondence, many offers of participation by people that one would take very seriously. The initial Wall Street Journal article created a wave of positive responses from around the globe and a growing political momentum for change. The British government has specifically embraced the initiative and has said it will be a disarmament laboratory to help lead a worldwide effort. I expect that many, perhaps all of you here today, um, read an article which appeared in the Wall Street Journal at the start of this year. The writers would be as familiar to an audience in this country as they are respected across the globe. George Schultz, William Perry, Henry Kissinger, Sam Nunn. The article made the case for, and I quote, a bold initiative consistent with America's moral heritage. That initiative was to reignite the vision of a world free of nuclear weapons and to redouble effort on the practical measures towards it. The need for such vision and action is all too apparent. A chain reaction of articles and opinion pieces by other senior statesmen from around the world and across party lines has turned the call of the American Four into a global dialogue. The Indian government has reaffirmed its commitment to a world without nuclear weapons. Australian Prime Minister Kevin Rudd and former Japanese Prime Minister Yasuo Fukuda announced the creation of an international commission on nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament. Over two-thirds of living former U.S. Secretaries of State, Secretaries of Defense, and National Security Advisors have endorsed the initiative. Former President Gorbachev continues to work toward the goal of eliminating nuclear weapons. The danger is that there are still too many nuclear weapons and we need to start getting rid of those weapons. Secondly, the longer we have nuclear weapons and not just the existence of nuclear weapons that exist today, but possibly nuclear weapons in the hands of other countries, or new nuclear powers, the more dangerous the situation is going to be. It's like that famous rifle on the wall, which will one day fire. U.S. leaders like Governor Schwarzenegger have also begun to speak out. Everyone knows that I grew up in Austria as a boy. The Red Army loomed over us from its bases in Central Europe. Now, even as a child, we all knew about the threat of nuclear weapons in the nuclear war. We knew the blinding power of its flash and we knew the shape of its cloud. Over the years, the intense, glaring threat of nuclear war faded. All of a sudden, we didn't think about this anymore as the major threat or the major concern uh, that people have and had always for so many years during the Cold War. But the reality of it is today, the nuclear threat has returned with vengeance. The vengeance of a terrorist. See, there's a whole new world now since 9-11. The Soviets had nuclear weapons, and did not use them. And today, the I mean, let's be honest, is there any doubt where the terrorists would use them? Every U.S. president since President Johnson has pledged to work toward the elimination of nuclear weapons as dictated by the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And as recently as last May, all of the declared nuclear weapon states reaffirmed their, quote, unequivocal undertaking, unquote, toward that end. Great nations keep their word, and I, for one, will continue to push the U.S. and the other nuclear weapon states to fulfill their pledge. President Obama has endorsed that goal as a fundamental tenet of his international policy. The existence 
of thousands of nuclear weapons is the most dangerous legacy of the Cold War. Today, the Cold War has disappeared, but thousands of those weapons have not. In a strange turn of history, the threat of global nuclear war has gone down, but the risk of a nuclear attack has gone up. The technology to build a bomb has spread. Terrorists are determined to buy, build, or steal one. One nuclear weapon exploded in one city, be it New York or Moscow, Islamabad or Mumbai, Tokyo or Tel Aviv, Paris or Prague, could kill hundreds of thousands of people. And no matter where it happens, there is no end to what the consequences might be. So today, I state clearly and with conviction, America's commitment to seek the peace and security of a world without nuclear weapons. Now, we harbor no illusions about the difficulty of bringing about a world without nuclear weapons. We know there are plenty of cynics and that there will be setbacks to prove their point. But there will also be days like today that push us forward, days that tell a different story. It is the story of a world that understands that no difference or division is worth destroying all that we have built and all that we love. It is a recognition that can bring people of different nationalities and ethnicities and ideologies together. In my own country, it has brought Democrats and Republican leaders together. Uh, leaders like George Shultz, Bill Perry, Henry Kissinger, and Sam Nunn, who are with us here today. Senator McCain voiced his commitment to nuclear disarmament both in his 2008 presidential campaign and again on the floor of the United States Senate. We should stop and think for a moment not only the perils of a world awash with nuclear weapons, but also of the more hopeful alternative, a world in which there are far fewer such weapons than there are today, and in which proliferation, instability, and nuclear terrorism are far less likely. A quarter of a century ago, Ronald Reagan declared, our dream is to see the day when nuclear weapons will be banished from the face of the earth. That is my dream, too. Meeting in London, President Obama and Russian President Medvedev released a statement saying, we committed our two countries to achieving a nuclear weapons-free world. I believe that we are in a race between cooperation and catastrophe in terms of making sure we do not have catastrophic nuclear terrorism. And all of the good things I can imagine for the future, for my children, for my grandchildren, depend on preventing the catastrophes that could result from a nuclear bomb going off in one of our cities. That could dramatically change our life in ways we cannot imagine and curtail the dreams of all of the other things we want to happen. More states are acquiring nuclear weapons or developing the technology to build them. And as we have seen, a terrorist organization would need no more than one or two of those weapons or the material to make them to throw our planet into chaos. The danger is very, very real. We are at a nuclear tipping point, and the actions being taken are not adequate to the threat. We cannot uninvent nuclear weapons. We cannot repeal E equals MC squared. The way I view it is that if you view the goal of getting to zero as the top of the mountain in terms of nuclear weapons, then we can't even see the top of the mountain today. We're heading down, we're not heading up. It's gonna take a long time to see the top of the mountain, but I think we have an obligation to our children and to our grandchildren to build paths up the mountain to get other people to go up the mountain with us because this cannot be unilateral. We don't quite know what the mountaintop will look like. We don't quite know how to get to that mountaintop. 
And we won't make any proposals that we cannot justify, but we are determined to go up that mountaintop. If we don't give them that hope, those of us who've been through the Cold War, uh, if we don't give them that hope and that vision, then it's going to be extremely difficult to prevent the kind of nuclear nightmare that um, is looming on the horizon. A man named Max Campbellman, who had been my counselor when I was Secretary of State, made an eloquent statement emphasizing the importance of talking about what ought to be. If you're constantly mired in what is, and you never look at what ought to be, you're never going to really get anywhere. And he used the Declaration of Independence as an example. All men are created equal in 1776. Are you kidding? We had slaves. Women couldn't vote. If you, you had to have property in order to vote. We had the ought up there. And gradually, over time, often with a lot of pain and agony and difficulty, but gradually, the is has come closer to the ought. And we ought to have a world free of nuclear weapons. Once nuclear weapons are used, we will be driven to take global measures to prevent it. So some of us have said, let's ask ourselves, if we have to do it afterwards, why don't we do it now? Here's what you can do now to support the essential steps that will help prevent nuclear terrorism and the spread of nuclear weapons, and ultimately end them as a threat to the world. Show this documentary in your community and discuss it with your family and friends. You can order it free at nuclearsecurityproject.org and get the latest information on the Nuclear Security Project. Engage your members of Congress and your senators. Explore their views and share yours. Act now for a safer world.